This Week at NASA. Juno is on schedule and on budget. NASA's upcoming Juno mission to Jupiter was previewed by scientists and engineers at a Kennedy Space Center news briefing. The size of uh, Juno is about 11 and a half feet tall, about 11 and a half feet wide. The uh, diameter of the circle is about 80 feet in diameter. We're the first ones to go out that far to, to Jupiter's distance, uh, solar powered. Juno's goal is to improve our understanding of our solar system's beginning by revealing data about the gas giant's evolution. Juno will get closer to Jupiter than any other spacecraft to provide detailed images and the first glimpse of its poles. What we're really after is discovering the recipe for making planets, and we're back at the first step of making sure we have all the ingredients in that recipe. Juno is scheduled to launch August 5th from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Juno is really the first in a whole series of planetary science missions that are beginning. Juno will launch in early August. We'll have GRAIL going to the moon in September, and then we'll launch the Mars Science Laboratory to Mars in November. With the recent selection of the Gale Crater as its landing site on the Red Planet, the Mars Science Laboratory mission is now one step closer to its scheduled launch this November. NASA's next Mars rover, car-sized Curiosity, would land in August of next year at the foot of a giant layered mountain inside Gale. There is this enormous stack, five kilometers thick of layered material, which represents the opportunity to literally read chapters in a book of the history of past deposition on Mars. During a prime mission lasting one Martian year, nearly two Earth years, researchers will use the rover's tools to study whether the landing region had favorable environmental conditions for supporting microbial life and for preserving clues about whether life ever existed. With this plaque hanging ceremony at Mission Control in Houston, the STS-135 crew that completed the final space shuttle mission aboard Atlantis paid tribute to flight controllers at the Johnson Space Center who supervised its 13-day mission. Had a chance to allow everyone to take it all in. Commander Chris Ferguson, pilot Doug Hurley, and mission specialist Sandy Magnus and Rex Walmart took part in the traditional ceremony that spanned both the International Space Station and Space Shuttle Flight Control rooms. You know, every time we go flying, we take a little piece of you with us, and uh, we hopefully maybe just brought you uh, along a, a little bit more on this flight. If you think about a year ago, this flight didn't even exist. It was the STS-335 rescue mission, and uh, really it was just a, a gleam in Mike Suffredini's eyes back then. And, uh, and then here we are, fast forward through 12 incredibly busy months of, of preparation, and look at what we accomplished. We never lost focus. You never lost heart. You never lost your morale. You never lost the discipline with which we have been taught to come into this room and all of the surrounding rooms to do what we do. And for that, I think you all deserve to be commended. So let's give yourselves a round of applause. What we are trying to do in this administration is return NASA to that more classical role of our 1958 Space Act of investing in technologies. Deputy Administrator Lori Garver was keynote speaker at the Space Frontier Foundation's annual New Space Conference held at the Ames Research Center. New Space allows entrepreneurs, investors, scientists, engineers, regulators, and space policy leaders to discuss the opening of space to human settlement. The theme of this year's three-day forum, The Next Big Thing, focused on the emerging commercial space industry. These are people who believe in what we do, who believe that NASA is the government's part of the advancement of humanity into space. And of course, we want to uh, help communicate with them about the things we're doing so that they can uh, take that further. It's great to be here. I did not While at Ames, Garver also sat down for an up-close and personal chat with members and guests of the center's chapter of WIN, the Women's Influence Network. Garver spoke about her personal experiences and role in the evolving workplace, barriers she's had to overcome, and advice for those working to achieve personal and professional success. They do have time. 
hire teams. They go to they go overseas. They go you know Pearl Harbor. They go. The Kennedy Space Center teamed up with the U.S. Office of Personnel Management and Brevard Workforce to host a job fair in Cape Canaveral for shuttle workers. This Space Coast job fair and hands-on training event attracted hundreds of job seekers and more than 60 federal and private sector employers from across the country. How could a program that would be a, an awesome program for her? NASA has been working with local, state, and federal officials to provide future planning and placement assistance for non-civil servant contractors who work to support the space shuttle program, which will end next month. NASA's Human Resources Office has also hosted workshops, seminars, and other events to help prepare employees for future opportunities. And so my job is to look at the ARINC 424 database closely. That's a Students from several NASA aeronautics-sponsored programs spent two days at headquarters reporting on their accomplishments and experiences working at the agency. Recipients of aeronautics scholarships were joined by students from the agency's Aeronautics Academy in making 10-minute presentations to ARMD officials, including Associate Administrator Jaywon Shin. In the STEM education is... This is the fourth consecutive year that student scholars and fellows have studied aeronautics and related fields in summer internships guided by NASA professionals. Both programs attempt to foster new generations of highly skilled scientists and engineers critical to the future of the nation's aeronautics industry. It's awesome. Uh, this summer has definitely given me the opportunity to see a lot of different aspects of aeronautics research and be a part of something I never thought that I would. Our pilot, Gregory Box Johnson, uh, he's a... Members of the STS-134 crew stopped by the Stennis Space, Space Center to share video highlights from their 16-day mission to the International Space Station aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour. Mission specialists Greg Shamatov and Mike Fink mingled and took questions from the Stennis staff. I couldn't help notice that y'all like to kind of Superman through the hallways over there. Also engaged in some Q&A with youngsters participating in the center's summer astro camp sessions. Do you see black or does the ultraviolet and infrared light affect what you see behind your eyelids? During STS-134, Space Shuttle Endeavour delivered spare parts to the complex and transported and installed AMS-2 a particle physics detector that'll increase our understanding of the origins of the universe. Welcome to the third installment of the Legends series. Stennis Space Center's year-long 50th anniversary celebration continued with the third round of its Legends Lecture Series. The series features influential current and former civil service and contractor employees who have contributed to the growth and development of Stennis throughout the years. They had me typing software on a typewriter with a little round ball that had letters and numbers on it. I had never seen a typewriter like that before, and what the heck was software? <laughs> this particular presentation brought together administrative assistants who've served in the center director's office over the center's half century. The center legends gave a unique behind-the-scenes glimpse into life in the front office. I worked for engineers, I worked for retired military, I worked for an astronaut, and I don't know any other organization I could have worked for and worked for those type of people. They were all great to work for. And that's This Week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, log on to www.nasa.gov.